Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and you're very warm. Welcome to Friday Fretworks, and this week we're taking a look at arguably the most famous chord of all time. Yet, 57 years after it's released, it's still shrouded in mystery, not only as to what was played, but more importantly, how it was played. We're of course talking about the Beatles' A Hard Day's Night. <laughs> If you saw last week's episode of Friday Frightworks, taking a look at Rickenbacker guitars, you may well have caught a fleeting reference to the start of A Hard Day's Night, specifically how I thought it was recorded with two Rickenbacker guitars. Of course, George Harrison's 36012 string and John Lennon's 325. Quite rightly, many of you were quick to point out that, of course, Paul McCartney was involved as well. I didn't literally mean it was just those two guys with their two Rickenbackers. But upon reflection, it occurred to me that, save for some anecdotal evidence I've heard over the years, I've never really given the start of a hard day's night too much thought. So you can imagine my surprise that in really digging into it, trying to find out what makes it tick, at least 50% of the things that I thought I knew turned out to be incorrect. And considering it is one of the most famous introductions of all time, recorded by a band who between 62 and 69, near enough every move they made was fastidiously documented, it's alarming to see how much misinformation there really is about those first three seconds. So in today's video, I'm going to try and get to the bottom of it and conclusively prove what exactly was happening. The start of A Hard Day's Night can be broken down roughly into five elements. The first of which we're going to look at today is Paul McCartney's bass. Paul is playing his 1963 Hofner violin bass, presumably through a Vox AC100 head that the Beatles had been using only several weeks earlier whilst on tour in Paris and in the US. Now, it's a commonly accepted fact that Paul is playing a D note, but where he is playing it has been the source of much discussion over the years. And one very common train of thought is that he's playing it on the 12th fret of the D string. However, by running the start of a hard day's night through a piece of software called Transcribe, in essence a spectrum analyzer that translates the frequencies into a kind of graphic depiction of what you are hearing, very clearly shows a strong set of overtones at D2. This roughly translates to the D note played on the 5th fret of your A string or the 10th fret of your E string. Also marries that perfectly with what Paul has played countless times live over the years on live performances of a hard day's night. Now to recreate this I'm going to be using a reissue 19. 63 Hofner violin bass, a left-handed one, it's worth mentioning, so that should be interesting, running into Logic Pro using a bass amp emulation within there. In isolation, sounds a little bit like this. Next up, we have George Harrison's part. George was using, of course, his Rickenbacker 36012 string through a Vox AC50. And given George was fairly unequivocal over the years about exactly what chord he was playing, to answer your question, it's F with a G on the first string. Thank you very much. Dear little finger. Thank you very much. Sounds better on a 12 string. You'd think that it would be a relatively open and shut case. However, thanks to a few prominent suggestions over the years, that George in fact played a G in the bass, as opposed to the much more obvious F, it's still an ongoing discussion. And of course, Gary Moore even found himself famously halfway through asking George Harrison if he really was sure that was how he played A Hard Day's Night. However, thanks to the Beatles edition of the game Rock Band, which was released several years ago, and the subsequent master tapes that leaked online, you can very clearly hear George's 12 string in isolation playing an F add 9 chord with an F in the bass. To recreate this, I'm using a Rickenbacker 37012, very kindly loaned to me by Andrew, the owner of A Strings Music, an absolutely brilliant guitar shop in Pontypridd in South Wales. If you're ever in the area, do stop in and say hello, it's a total treasure trove of gear. All of that running into a Vox emulation within Guitar Rig, running within Logic. All of that together sounds like this. <laughs> Next up, we have John Lennon's part, which is probably the most heavily discussed segment of the chord. It's an off repeated tale that John Lennon used his Rickenbacker 325 to play a D sus 4 chord. However, when the Beatles album Love was released in 2006, the surround sound mix allowed for easier or cleaner isolation of several parts that had never really been heard before, including this amazing part. Not only is John not using his Rickenbacker, but crucially, he's not playing a D sus4 chord. He's actually playing an F add 9, the same chord as George Harrison, but with one extra note ringing out, which if you couldn't quite guess it, the Spectrum Analyzer clearly reveals as an open A note. Now to recreate this, I'm going to be using a Gibson J160 copy made by Vintage, which sounds a little bit like this. <laughs> 
Next up, and arguably most crucial to the overall sound of the recording, is of course the piano part. It's not often acknowledged or spoken about, but if you listen to the introduction, especially just before the vocals come in, you can very clearly hear a sustaining piano chord, which is of course revealed absolutely beautifully on the isolated master tapes. <laughs> This was recorded later on as an overdub by Beatles producer George Martin, crucially using the sustain pedal on the piano, which of course allows all the strings in the piano to vibrate in sympathy, giving it its characteristic clang, for want of a better phrase. Now due to this, it's a bit of a nightmare to try and analyse via Spectrum Analyzer, because you've got these overtones flying around all over the place. But having spoken to a few piano playing friends of mine, I'm fairly confident in saying that the notes you're actually hearing are a D2, G2, D3, G3, and a C4. Now, using Logic's Steinway piano emulation, that in isolation sounds a little bit like this. Last, but definitely not least, we of course have Ringo Starr's part, which was recorded using his Ludwig Oyster Black Pearl kit. Now, I'm not entirely sure I agree with the common conclusion here that we can hear a kick, snare, and a crash, although, to be honest, it's mixed so low that really doesn't make a great deal of difference whether you include two or three of those elements. So I've decided to go for all three, just as it is the prevailing thought. I'm using Logic's Liverpool drum kit, no guess is what that's based on, which in isolation sounds like this. So I guess all that's left to do really is compare the original with all of the parts that I've just put down. Now after I bounced them all down to a single mix, I added a touch of compression and also used Logic's Match EQ plugin to emulate that strident mid-range that you can hear on the original recording. It's also worth mentioning that I used the original mono mix as a reference as opposed to the latest stereo mix, kind of more closely representative of the sound as a whole, and not so much the dramatic panning which you can hear sometimes on the later Beatles stereo remixes. So let's have a listen. So there you have it. Now there's a few little things leaping out to me that, I guess in a perfect world, that would take a little bit more time to try and accurately nail the sound of the original recording, but when you are trying to recreate an old analogue recording, there are so many variables. The mics, the pre's, the compressors, the room, the amps used, etc, etc. It is nigh on impossible to perfectly match, but at least to me, to be honest, it sounds pretty damn close. And ultimately the point of this video was to try and demystify the chord to a certain degree, and try and debunk some of the stuff which you read or hear about this chord, which patently just isn't true. As ever, I'm Chris Buck. Thank you very much for watching Friday Fretworks. Please stick around, subscribe, hit the bell icon for more episodes every week. And I shall see you soon. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you next week.